Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV original webinar series. Uh, today we have my very good friend with me, Dr. Amin Rajani. He is. Uh, we studied together post graduation in Sion Hospital. He is currently an assistant professor of orthopedics in Grand Medical College. He is attached to Breach Candy Hospital, Leelawati Hospital, and Saifi Hospital in Mumbai. He is going to talk on UKR. Welcome to the future concepts and technique. This webinar is brought to you by GSK Consumer, the makers of Iodex Ultra Gel. Over to Dr. Amin Rajani. Thank you so much, Neeraj, and a big thank you to Ortho TV and Dr. Ashok Sham for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, one of my favorite surgeries, the unicondylar knee replacement surgery. Now, earlier in my practice, I used to do a lot of total knee replacement surgeries, but the percentage has now reduced drastically. I personally feel that 70% uh, of the osteoarthritis that we see in our daily practice may require a unicondylar knee replacement and only 30% uh, which are tricompartmental osteoarthritis, they require a total knee replacement surgery. But before I start and begin my presentation, I would like to thank two of the most important people in my life, uh, Dr. CJ Thakkar, who's been my mentor, guide and teacher, and I've learned much more than orthopedics from him and Dr. Christopher Dodd, uh, with whom I had the opportunity to train and work under uh, to learn the unicorn uh, compartmental knee replacement surgery at Oxford. So why a unicondylar knee replacement? We are doing so many TKRs, it's almost like a general orthopedic surgery, everybody's doing it, and it's very safe, it's very simple with predictable results. So why go into something which is unknown? Now unicondylar knee replacement surgery uh, it treats the pathology of the affected compartment, leaving the other structures of the knee normal. And that gives us a more anatomical knee with less morbidity and faster recovery with minimal rehabilitation so that the patient is satisfied to the great extent. But most of the surgeons, they are not very happy with this surgery. They don't want to do it. And there are many reasons for that. I have classified these reasons into three categories. The surgeon factor in which uh, the, the fact of the matter is that there is not many surgeon to surgeon training programs uh, for unicondylar knee replacement surgery because there are not many surgeons who are doing this in India as well as abroad. The Oxford course is held in India once a year and it is mandatory uh, and technically important to attend this course before you begin the surgery. So attending the course and you're doing the surgery, it is illegal. The third surgeon factor is that it's got a long and steep learning curve. And at whatever career stage you are in, once you start doing unique compartmental knee replacement surgery, you should be aware that you are going to face challenges and complications. And that is one of the reasons why most uh, senior surgeons, set surgeons don't want complications in their practice and probably don't want to do something new. The other factor is the peer pressure. Now, if you start doing unicompartment knee replacement surgeries, you're going to face complications. And just in case you uh, go down the ladder, there is no, not anybody going to support you. In fact, you might face a backlash as to why you did a unicompartmental knee when a TKR was a more safer surgery. The third factor is the patient factor. Now, when we say partial knee replacement surgery, the patient thinks that it is a half job done and uh, they want to pay you half as well. Now, that is the reason why we should stop calling it partial knee and call it a unicompartmental or a unicondylar knee replacement surgery. And we have to explain to our, our patients and make them aware why this surgery is more better than a total knee replacement surgery. But to do that, we have to understand the concept. So the learning curve, why is it difficult? This is because it is not like a routine knee replacement surgery. The concepts are very, very different. You are operating in a different uh, position of the patient from a small window, and that can lead to complexity and complications. And uh, as I also said, at whatever stage the career of the surgeon is in, uh, he should be ready to face the complication if he has to go through this learning curve. There are two types of UKR. One is a fixed bearing UKR and a mobile bearing UKR. The fixed bearing UKR has recently come in the last five years to six years, 
but the mobile bearing has been there since about 30 years and with a newer instrumentation uh, instrumentation newer generation implants the long term results are very very good i do a lot of mobile bearing and that is what i'm going to be talking about to you in this presentation so who is an ideal candidate for a unicompartmental knee one who has an anterior medial osteoarthritis one in which all the ligaments especially the acl is intact who has a normal lateral condyle who has a varus of less than 15 degrees which is correctable clinically and radiologically and one who has less than 15 degrees of flexion deformity so these are the criteria one the patient has to fulfill before you can decide whether he's a good enough candidate for a partial knee replacement surgery and most of the patients that we see in our daily practice they fit this criteria what are the contraindications there is only one contraindication to doing a unicompartmental knee replacement surgery is inflammatory arthritis and it is very important important and imperative that we investigate the patient for inflammatory arthritis before we decide to do a unicompartmental knee a surgery in that patient but there are a lot of contraindications uh, uh, the myths of contraindications where people say that you cannot do uh, this unicompartmental knee surgery in uh, if the patient has a patellofemoral arthritis or the patient is very old or there is a high bmi or you know patient is doing a lot of high activity work according to the oxford criteria and according to the oxford group they have clarified that none of these myths a contraindication to unicompartmental knee surgery i myself have been i have operated about three patients who are above 80 years of age and you will see in the results patellofemoral arthritis generally is not a detrimental to doing this surgery and nor is bmi and high activity work so once you decide that you want to do a, knee, a partial knee replacement or a unicompartmental knee replacement surgery in the particular patient we need to do a preoperative workup which includes a clinical evaluation and a radiological evaluation now i'm going to be talking about the salient features which are required to evaluate a knee whether it's fit for unicompartmental or not less than 15 degrees of varus which you have to measure whether the varus is correctable or not as i mentioned earlier whether there is anterior medial joint line tenderness and whether the acl is functional or not apart from these four criteria it is important that we measure the patient's height as well when he comes to the opd and i'll talk about the uh, reason for measuring height in the later slides preoperative radiological assessment includes a standard weight bearing x ray ap which should show a bone on bone osteoarthritis and a normal lateral joint space we all know how to take a standard ap, AP x ray just in case you are unsure radiologically that there is bone on bone osteoarthritis which can happen sometimes but you are clinically very confident that it uh, is bone in bone you can do a rosenberg view which is done in about 45 degrees of knee flexion with patient standing it's a pa view with the beam angled at 10 degrees cranio caudal to the knee this gives us a precise picture of the uh, medial as well as the lateral compartment along with the notch so you can see uh, the osteophytes you can also see uh, whether there is any kind of wear or tear in the lateral compartment clearly a lateral x ray is one of the most important x rays in a uni compartmental knee and the reason for that is that when you have a look at the lateral x ray make sure that you are looking at the posterior cartilage of the tibia if the posterior cartilage is intact then it is a classical anterior medial arthritis if by chance the disease has progressed or the acl is not functioning the femur is going to subluxate posteriorly on the tibia and you will see wear and tear in the posterior cartilage this would be a no for a unicompartmental knee surgery this means that the disease has progressed or the acl is not functioning so lateral x ray is very important and it is important to take a correct lateral x ray a shoot through lateral x ray would be ideal a valgus stress test it is done for documentation purpose whether you can correct the valgus uh, the varus deformity with a valgus uh, stress 
but it is generally not recommended. It becomes very difficult in day-to-day -day practice to get a, a, a valgus stress X-ray done, but you can do it in the initial days of your practice. Well, uh, what I would recommend for people who are starting a uh, unicondylar knee replacement is to do an MRI. Now, you have to be very confident that you are selecting the right patient who has a normal lateral cartilage, the ACL is intact, there is no other internal injury. So MRI would be helpful for the, for the surgeon as well as from the medical legal point of view as to whether you are uh, doing uh, the correct surgeon in a rightly indicated patient. Arthroscopies were done, diagnostic arthroscopies were done earlier. Uh, but I don't see any role of diagnostic arthroscopy. Once you can do an MRI, it's really not required. So we're going to be talking about the salient features of technique of uh, compartmental knee surgeries. Sizing, preoperative sizing is very, very important. So it can be done by templating, but you know we have issues with magnifications and sometimes the templating is incorrect. And that is why the height of the patient is important. Now, what the Oxford group has done is that it's made a standardized chart uh, according to the height of the patient as to what would be the size of the implants. Now, for a standard Indian male, the uh, femur size would be somewhere around me um, uh, medium and the tibia side would be about B or C. And in a standard Indian woman, the femur side would be about extra small or small and the tibia size would be double A or A. So once we know the height of the patient, we can preoperatively judge as to what would be the size of the implants. Well, you can also judge the sizing of the implants intraoperatively. Now there is a spoon which is available. So there is an extra small spoon, a small spoon, a medium spoon, a large spoon, four types of sizes available for the femur. What you need to do is you need to put this spoon right snugly into the medial femoral condyle and make sure that the spoon is stable, after which you have to check that there should be about three to four millimeters gap between the spoon and the surface of the medial femoral condyle, which shows the cartilage wear. So once you decide what spoon you're going to use, you know the size, it's small, medium, large, or extra small. For the tibial size, once you extract the biscuit after doing your tibial cut, you measure the tibial size with the opposite or the contralateral tibial base plate to confirm the size of the tibia base plate that you're going to be using. The patient position is again very different from a standard TKR. It is in a hanging position with a well supported uh, thigh support. It's placed in such a fashion that the lower part of the thigh and the leg is free and one is able to bend the knee to about 120 degrees which is re required intraoperatively. I mean, your voice went off. So the patient position is very different from that of a standard total knee replacement surgery. The patient is positioned in such a way that the leg is hanging, supported by a thigh support in the middle of the thigh. The lower part of the thigh and the leg is hanging and free. And one should be able to flex the knee to about 120 degrees, which is a requirement intraoperatively. This is a difficult position to operate in once, uh, when you're a beginner, but it has its advantages. The advantage here is that you can get a gravity assisted tensioning and then you will never go wrong in your flexion extension gaps. The disadvantage of this position, there are two. The first and foremost one is that intraoperatively, if you feel that you want to convert your partial knee replacement into a total knee replacement, you will have a big problem changing the position of the patient and redraping once you've done an arthrotomy. But it can be done. It has been done in the past and it, it still can be done uh, very safely. The second disadvantage is that with this position, there's a good chance that the instruments and the implants can fall down on the ground and then you are stuck. Now, I know you, you may not understand what I am saying, but once you start doing this surgery, this is a very, very common complications initially that you drop the instruments, you drop the implant, you have one set and then you're stuck till uh, the dropped instrument or implant is autoclaved again. So uh, there is a technique to avoid that and I'm going to show you that in the next slide. The surgical team position is also very important. Now the surgeon stands in the center or slightly medially 
with both his assistants on either side of the knee. The other leg is in a lithotomy position or it is kept on the stool and abducted. Now the back trolley should be in such a fashion as when you're operating a left knee, it should be on the right side of the surgeon. And if you're operating on the right knee, it should be on the left side of the surgeon in a right hand dominant surgeon. Now this is important because it is easy for the right hand dominant surgeon to pick up the instruments from the trolley and then keep it back. And this will avoid the falling of the instrument. So this is what I practice and I feel it is uh, very, very safe to do that. Uh, and uh, the incidence of instruments dropping becomes very, very less right from the beginning. The incision is from the superior pole of the patella slightly medially running down obliquely or curving down towards the upper portion of the tibial fibrosity. It's about a five inch long incision. And once you incise, you probably uh, go ahead and do an arthrotomy either by a mid, mini midwastus approach or a standard medial parapatella approach. Once the arthrotomy is done, it is imperative that you go ahead and remove the fat pad. Now the fat pad can actually block your vision and it is important that you remove it completely so that your medial femoral condyle is well exposed. You're able to see the ACL and toggle it to make sure that it is intact. Once that is done, you start removing the anterior horn of the medial meniscus along with the periosteum. Now you can only do that till the anterior medial border of the tibia. Please understand you cannot release the MCL under any circumstances whilst doing a UKR. So the MCL is not touched at all. Also to enhance your exposure, you need to do remove the osteophytes from the medial femoral uh, condyle as well as only from the anterior part of the tibia if there are any osteophytes there. You also have to remove osteophytes from the lateral part of the medial femoral condyle in the notch and the medial part of the lateral femoral condyle in the notch so that there is no impingement of ACL or PCL. Now doing all this enhances your exposure to a great extent. You can also probably subluxate the patella and have a look at the lateral condyle of the femur. As I mentioned earlier, protection of the MCL is very, very important because if you damage the MCL, you are doomed. You can't go ahead and do this surgery. Now to protect this MCL, there is an MCL protector, which is available in the instrument set. Dr. Chris calls it the curly whirly due to the design. And what in, you need to do is you need to put this curly whirly underneath the MCL at the level of the joint and then ask your assistant to hold it at all times so that the MCL is protected during any of the cuts that you're doing or during milling. The tibial cut is two types, the vertical cut and the horizontal cut. Now the vertical cut is done in such a fashion that it is just medial to the medial tibial spine, touching the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle, and it is pointed towards the anterior superior iliac spine. Now the tip that I want to give you here is that when you're doing your vertical sawing, make sure that you do not lift your hand as you can see in the picture. I've lifted my hand. This should not be done. Otherwise your posterior cut will be very, very deep and you will fracture the tibia. So this is something which is very important, which you have to understand that you cannot raise your hands while sawing, doing the vertical sawing. And it is very commonly done when you begin your, doing your surgeries. The horizontal tibial cut can be done with the help of the tibial jig or freehand. You have to take out minimum of three millimeters of the tibial biscuit whilst protecting the MCL. If your cut is less than three millimeters, your joint will be very tight. You will not be able to put in an insert because the minimum insert side is, uh, size is three millimeters. And the maximum cut that one should take is about four millimeters. The reason for that is that you don't want an increased gap and the insert side which is available in a unique four, five, six, and seven. So you have to make sure that your gaps are not too narrow and not too wide. Otherwise you'll get stuck again. This is what the tibial biscuit looks like. Now, un unfortunately, I cannot use the pointer, but if you can see the anterior part 
which is inferior in the uh, picture, is completely devoid of the cartilage. And the posterior part, which is the superior part in the picture, has good enough cartilage. That means that there is only an anterior wear. And again, you are confirmed with your diagnosis that this is an anterior medial arthritis. Again, now I'm going to differentiate between a TKR and a UKR for you so that it becomes simple. In a TKR, our opening of the medullary canal is more central, whereas the opening of the medullary canal in the UKR is slightly more medial, probably in line with the border of the uh, lateral border of the medial femoral epicondyle or just lateral to it. Once the medullary canal is opened up, you put in a medullary rod. And then you mark the central third of the medial femoral condyle. Now, everything that we do in a UKR has a reason. We do this so that we can put the femoral drill guide in such a position that the central third of the femur is right in the center of the peg holes. This will help us in alignment and rotations. Once the drill holes are drilled, uh, before, before drilling these peg holes, what you need to do is you can also use a link device which is available in the instrumentation set. Now the link device basically helps in alignment and rotation. So one limb of the link device goes into the medullary rod that you have put in the canal and the other limb goes into the femoral drill guide which you have put uh, snugly fitted on the femur. So now you have a good alignment, a good rotation. Go ahead and drill uh, your peg holes uh, so that you are able to put the posterior femoral jig. Now the posterior femoral jig is put in such a fashion that the pegs of the posterior femoral jig go right inside uh, the drill holes which you have just drilled. And whilst doing, uh, whilst doing uh, the posterior cut, I, I am signed out. Am I Neeraj? Because that is what it's showing on my computer. Hello? You have been so the posterior femoral uh, jig is then inserted into those uh, uh, drill holes which we have created. And whilst doing the sawing, you have to make sure that you drop your hand now to capture the adequate amount of the posterior cut. Now, if you don't do, then you will just skid off and you will not be able to have any posterior cut. So these are important tips which you have to remember before you start doing this surgery. Now, unlike in TKR, in a UKR, we need to create a flexion gap first. And the extension gap is supposed to match the flexion gap and not vice versa, which you generally tend to do in a TKR. So once the flexion gap is created, you measure the flexion gap with the spacer given. Now you can see in this picture, it is about four uh, millimeter size of the spacer. You then go ahead and do your distal milling. Now this distal milling is done with the help of spigots which are of different lengths and hence different sizes and you have to take that size which matches your uh, flexion gap. So you would probably take a size 4. Now there is a little mathematical calculation in this and I will explain to you that uh, a little later or probably once you start doing the surgery I can probably show it to you uh, live. Uh, what you need to do is put in the spigot and start milling it. And once it has a, the milling has an auto stop and uh, the required amount of distal femur is then milled. You go ahead then and then check the extension gap. Now this gap is checked in 20 degrees of flexion. Remember when you're do, checking the flexion and extension gap, it is not supposed to be very, very tight like how it is in a TKR. You should be able to slide in the spacer and slide it out with two fingers, even for the flexion gap and even for the extension gap. That would be the right uh, amount of space which is required in a UKR. You should not have a very tight spacer and not a very loose spacer. So you should be able to slide in the spacer, as I said, with two fingers and slide it out as well. Now, once you are sure about your flexion extension gap, you put in the trial implants and then check the stability and the movements of the knee. Once you are satisfied, you go ahead and cement the components, uh, the final components inside. Now, before you uh, put the final, I mean, once you put the final components, the pressurization technique is very different in a UKR uh, compared to a TKR. You pressurize in about 45 degrees of flexion 
and not complete extension. The reason for that is that is that the implant is spherical in design. Now, if you are going to pressurize in complete extension, only the anterior aspect is going to get pressurized. And that is why to have a standard pressurization all over, you need to flex it to 45 degrees and then pressurize the cement in this fashion. Once the cement is set, it is very imperative to remove all the excess cement, especially from the posterior aspect of the medial compartment and from the notch. If you don't do that, what will happen is that these cement particles will become loose bodies and then may dislocate the poly, giving you trouble later on. Now, there are many complications of uh, any knee replacement, but for a UKR, there are four major complications which I'd like to discuss. The first is dislocation of poly. Now, everybody is scared of that. Now, this can happen for multiple reasons. The first reason is that there is instability. I mean, your poly was too loose to begin with and uh, uh, it just dislocated. The second reason is that your poly was too tight and that could also give rise to dislocation. The third reason for dislocation would be the loose body or the cement particles, which I mentioned earlier. They can just dislocate the poly. And the fourth reason for that is that there is an injury to the MCL or the ACL during the procedure or after the procedure. And that can give rise to dislocation. The second complication is loosening. Aseptic loosening, this can happen due to malalignment or malrotation or oversizing of the implant. The third dreaded complication is a medial condyle fracture. Now, this can happen if your posterior tibial cut is too deep, as I, as I mentioned earlier, during your vertical sawing. If the cut is too deep, you can have a fracture intraoperatively or probably you're always at, the patient is always at a risk of having a fracture postoperatively anytime. The fourth complication, which is rarely seen, is progression of the disease to the lateral compartment. Now, there are two reasons for that. The first reason would be that you've not selected the right patient and he had lateral compartmental osteoarthritis to begin with, which is generally rare. The second reason for progression of the disease to the lateral compartment is that you've given too much of valgus. You've overcorrected the varus. Now that can load the lateral compartment, giving rise to progression of the disease to the lateral compartment. That is why we always tend to undercorrect the varus deformity and keep the knee in slight amount of varus and not overcorrect it to neutral or valgus. Let's talk about some of the results. This is a two-stage UKR done in a 55-year-old female. As you can see on the AP exit, it's a medial compartmental osteoarthritis. The lateral, exa uh, the lateral joint space is absolutely normal. Uh, the lateral XA shows that the posterior tibial cartilage is intact. So the ACL is functioning and the disease has not progressed. This is the uh, uh, post-operative X-ray. Now this was stage TKR. So uh, the right side was done first and the left side later on. And this is the function of the patient. Now she's a 45 year old, uh, 55 year old lady. Uh, it's about three months since both her knees were operated and uh, she's able to do all her activities. You can see the, uh, the scar, which are small, about five inches. And she's able to do uh, her normal activities, walk around, even sit down on the floor, even squat without any difficulty. This shows that the patients are very, very satisfied after the surgery. 80 year old ex soldier. This is the second case. He's an army man. This is what his x-ray looks like. Now, 80 years, most of us would probably think about doing a total knee replacement, probably not a bilateral, maybe a staged uh, knee, total knee replacement for this patient. But have a look at this. This is the lateral condyle of this patient. Now, do you think we should go ahead and do a total knee replacement for this patient? I don't think so. And whenever you are doing total knee replacement surgeries by yourselves in routine patients, please have a look at the lateral condyle. Most of the times it is pristine and it is criminal to remove that cartilage and then replace it. Hence, went ahead and did a bilateral single stage UKR for this patient. You can see that the knee is left in some amount of varus on both the sides. 
and this is the function of the patient so being an army man uh, he wants to do all these acrobatics and he wanted to show me what all he can do so let's just see he started walking about 5 miles uh, two months after surgery and he's quite comfortable doing that he's walking like a stiff soldier but he's got excellent knee bending so let's look at wind swept deformity so we know what wind swept is it's a varus on one side and the valgus on the other side as if the wind is just blown uh, from one side of the knee now if you have a look at this x ray what do you think we should do it's a lateral compartmental osteoarthritis in the valgus knee a medial compartmental osteoarthritis in the varus knee uh, the disease has not progressed too much it is uh, in single compartment the acl is intact what i did was i did a total knee replacement on the valgus side and a partial knee replacement on the varus side and the patient is absolutely comfortable uh she actually there's there was a comparison uh, which was done and she felt much better uh, in the ukr initially for the first 3 or 4 months and then uh, she felt similar uh, on both the sides so uh, there have been studies which show that long term results of uh, ukr equal that of total knee but uh, the morbidity is less the patient recovery is much faster and that really has a big advantage and the other big advantage of doing a ukr is that you're saving bone so and you're not removing something which is normal so uh, i would definitely advocate uh, uh, doing a ukr in a uni compartmental uh, uh, in a uh, single compartment medial compartment loss have a look at this x-ray this is a standard medial compartment loss to arthritis with intact acl i was very this was one of my initial cases when i started about 5 years back and Uh, i was very happy after the surgery the patient was happy walking the very next day discharge uh, regular follow up for 6 months and then one day she called me up and she couldn't walk and this is what had happened she had dislocated now you can see the poly over there on the posterior aspect the poly is dislocated posteriorly and i was really really very scared uh, but i had the courage to go down and uh, do a total knee replacement surgery for this patient now a rod was actually not needed in this uh, particular uh, case but i wanted to be extra safe so i stemmed the tibia and the patient is absolutely comfortable it became a little difficult to explain to the patient as to why the uh, dislocation happened but when i retrospectively analyzed i feel that probably i may have damaged the mcl uh, intraoperatively which could have uh, created some amount of laxity so uh, once i went down inside uh, for the revision Uh, i could not even fit in a seven spacer uh, 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 you know for the ukr so i had to go down and do a tkr so most probably i did injure the mcl and it, it became lax so the take home message would be uh, the concepts of ukr are very unique and it may take a little time uh, to actually learn this procedure and confidently do it but once you start doing this procedure you will not look back and never think about a total knee replacement surgery the criteria of the patient has to be fulfilled uh, if any of any one of the criteria is also not fulfilled then it would not be a right candidate to go ahead and do a ukr i understand that this is a long learning curve and uh, you will face a lot of complications a lot of hesitations a lot of challenges whilst climbing up the ladder but uh, that is uh, something which we need to do we need to uh, keep innovating and change is the only constant Uh, so we need to uh, go ahead and learn new things and uh, as i said whatever stage of career you may be in uh, you may be in a uh, young surgeon or a, a middle aged surgeon uh, you should be ready to face challenges and complications once you start doing a ukr in your initial days there will be complications and uh, you should be bold enough to face them thank you for your attention uh, i hope i've uh, uh, kind and hopefully probably the next time i'd show you a live surgery thank you neeraj yeah uh thank you i mean that was a very comprehensive coverage of uh, ukr for a person like me who has not done any ukr or maybe have seen only four or five up till now is was a lot of uh, knowledge but i had a few questions i attended a webinar yesterday also on a tkr ukr so mm -hmm. i had a few questions from that webinar which were which i carry forward here 
so sure. tell me uh, now do you uh, when do you do routinely an mri before you decide to do a ukr so initial initial days yes uh, but for the first two or three years i did do a, a mri uh, on a regular basis now i do it only when i'm uh, slightly doubtful now what this advantage the mri has is that you know it uh, over diagnoses things and you may have some some amount of fraying uh, in the lateral side which is probably not even stage 1 and you would uh, then uh, don't will not do the surgery so when i was speaking with chris dot he told me that uh, once you're confident don't do an mri because then you're going to uh, over diagnose and you will uh, not do the upr so i i've stopped doing mris now and you showed this pa view of the x ray which yes. is relatively new and all x ray technicians in all hospitals are not so exactly. well worked with doing it so do you yes. supervise these x rays yourself or you have taught the technicians yeah so i uh, i send them to a particular uh, 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 radiology center which is close to my clinic and i have trained the technician to do that okay and uh, now the surgical technique so if you said that uh, so uh, there is this uh, intra operative decision where yes. you may have to convert a ukr into tkr sometimes yes and how many times have you done that so far so i have done that once uh, and uh, that was because uh, what happened was that when uh, i generally used to put in a small spike uh, on the in the notch to prevent damage to the acl and in that particular patient uh, the patient was quite osteoporotic so after taking all cuts i actually uh, uh, my assistant actually uh, avoids the uh, acl from the tibia because of the soft bone and i had almost finished the procedure but then i i had to change and uh, go ahead and do a total knee yes yeah, so it was difficult to change the position and redrape once the knee was open all the cuts taken but we somehow managed and the patient did not get infected so that is good to know uh, so the decision making in ukr versus tkr is very important pre operative and do you counsel all your patients that intra operative you may need a tkr and do you always keep the tkr implant ready yes i always keep the tkr implant ready uh, and i always tell the patient that uh, there could be a possibility that i might change my decision uh, once i'm inside but uh, that really happens and i tell that to the patient that it really happens probably there's only 0.1% chance that i may have to convert it because uh, after so many years i am very sure as to what i'm uh, doing and what are, what kind of patients i'm selecting for ukr okay and uh... about the ukr revision rates what is the literature say basically what is the revision rates in the so the uh, revision la- rates as per the literature and especially from the oxford group what it says is that the revision rate is equal to that of a total knee mm-hmm. so i uh, in fact i had i had once seen a, a, a ukr done by a very senior surgeon uh, who doesn't do that many ukrs and it had a 15 year survival rate so i mean i saw that patient 15 years after the ukr was done and i was surprised because uh that surgeon actually doesn't do that many ukr so doesn't do ukrs at all he probably did one or two so uh yes even in even in uh, not very experienced hands if the knee if the ukr can last 15 years probably if you're trained enough uh, it may last even longer okay so 15 years is almost as good as a normal knee replacement done that's by right. an average surgeon right. yeah. okay so i think that's all for my side uh one more last question now post operative rehabilitation do they have to undergo a lot of physiotherapy or it's comparatively no. less compared to a tkr much lesser much lesser because the patient starts walking the very second day uh without any support uh and the knee be- knee bending is about 100 degrees on the next morning uh, probably even the le- uh, late in the evening so i've started making my patients walk uh, late in the evening after the surgery and they're quite comfortable so i do give physiotherapy but uh, it is not required for more than about 7 to 10 days and then they are on their own yes what about post op pain control what do you use for that minimal pain uh, uh, so i use the standard drugs i do uh, inject a cocktail like i used to do in my total knees and uh, uh, co- this is done on the spinal anesthesia uh, and the cocktail and probably a paracep or paracetamol injections uh, for about uh, 24 hours and after that on oral analgesics yes so you don't use any type of adductor canal blocks or the no not for you care no absolutely okay. not i do use it for my tkrs occasionally but not for you care okay thank you very much we thank dr amin rajani for sparing his time and now uh, as we are getting back to work in unlock 1.0 in india hope everybody is going getting back to work we also thank our uh, we also thank gsk consumer the makers of iodex ultra gel to bring us this webinar thank you very much and bye bye and good night to all of you bye bye